Welcome to the review. Today we're taking a look at 10 failed TV shows from the 1996-1997 television season. More often than not, these shows were cancelled before airing the entire season, often leaving some unanswered questions as to what happened, both in storyline and in reality. Leave us a comment below if you remember watching any of these. Number 10, Easy Streets. He's got cataracts, for God's sake. The man can't even read a friggin' paper. He senses if the ball is over the plate. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Senses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he can judge the wind and, and the sound of the ball, yeah, that kind of thing. I see. Set in a mystical urban wasteland ravaged by greed, violence, and corruption, CBS's Easy Streets was an epic tale of trust and betrayal. Driven by morally compromised politicians, corrupt cops, unhinged gangsters, low-life junkies, and stool pigeons, the primary characters were three different men from various backgrounds. One a police detective who had just joined the intelligence division to clear his name after being categorized as a dirty cop. Others include an ex-con and a ruthless crime boss. The series premiered as a two-hour Sunday night movie on October 27th. It really comes down to the right show on the wrong network. Shows like this have to be extremely watered down in order to air on network television. And the watered down gangster is borderline comedy in my book. All right, fuzzball. Put one anywhere near me, you'd be saying goodbye to your teeth. Hopelessly unpopular with viewers, Easy Streets was yanked from the schedule. Relaunched the following spring, it ran for six more episodes before the network axed it again. Coincidentally, on the very same day that Time Magazine dubbed it the best TV show of the year. Unfortunately for those who did enjoy the series, being the best reviewed and least watched isn't going to amount to much. Granted, the material is neither original nor all that unique, but twists are spun in a way that keep the viewers off guard. Easy Street's repeats surfaced almost a decade later on the now-defunct cable channel Trio in a programming block titled Brilliant But Cancelled. After Easy Street's aired for that first week and shut down, creator Paul Haggis took it to HBO, bringing with him the first two episodes and plans they developed for a continuation of the story, which to their surprise, HBO loved it. Haggis quotes HBO as saying, This is great. We'd love to do this. We have a script coming in next week that we have to consider, which is the same sort of area, but if that doesn't pan out, we have to do this. Sadly for fans that nearly received an even darker and grittier HBO version, that script they were waiting on was The Sopranos. Imagine how different things could have been if Easy Streets aired on HBO and The Sopranos on CBS. Number nine, Lawless. Take away your blonde head your muscles, your chiseled looks, what do you got? You. Ah. No badges, no rules, no problem. This Fox detective drama would star ex-NFL linebacker and two-time Dick Buckus award winner, Brian the Boz Bosworth. Known for his radical hairstyles, his on-field play, and his criticism of the NCAA. His professional football career being cut short due to an injury. He tries luck in show business, earning himself some recognition with 1991's action film, Stone Cold. The film's story centers on a biker gang that tries to assassinate a district attorney and free one of their members on trial for murder. Although it performed poorly at the box office and took staggering losses, it served to gain Bosworth some attention. Now he was being offered a starring role as John Lawless in a new Fox show set to be released near the end of March. At one time, John was employed as a special forces operative, but he would trade one clandestine career for another when leaving the service, relocating to where else? Miami's South Beach and taking up work as a PI. A large part of the pilot is taken up by gratuitous shots of standard 90s filler on shows like these. Bodybuilders in biceps, beach babes in bikinis, surfboards, strip malls, and any number of blurry shots of neon-lit nightclubs. 
But once you've seen a few minutes of the acting and writing being delivered, the filler begins to look like the more entertaining part of the show. Would you prefer another table, maybe inside? No, this, this is fine, really. In between private dicking his way around Miami Beach on his motorcycle, Lawless spends downtime with his buddy Reggie, played by Glenn Plummer, who's not necessarily touted as a comedian, but that's the role he has here, and he plays it well. The trouble is just about every setup they give him is cheesy, but even with that, he does just about as good a job with the material as possible. There's my boy. <laughs> hey. Reggie owns a helicopter service that would no doubt come in handy in future episodic adventures. Episodic adventures that would ultimately never come to pass. The show's premiere wound up on Saturday night at 9, sneakily shifted at the very last minute under some suspicious circumstances. Fox's then new president didn't want to use any show greenlit under the previous regime. Promos and listings during the lead up to the pilot slated Lawless for debut on Friday. So naturally, people looking to check out this new series tuned in on Friday, only to find they've been bamboozled by the boss. It was done so late in the game that there was no way for listings or promos to be updated in time. Was it boss worthy of a watch? Audiences on the whole would likely never find out. Following that disastrous Friday night, the ratings were so understandably low that there was no coming back from it. Keeping in mind, it's reported that the network shelled out $6 million to develop these six episodes. Lawless was deemed lifeless and canceled immediately following that pilot episode. Despite being voted too ugly for TV by everyone who chose not to tune in, the boss would go on to bigger and better. However, Brian Bosworth would rarely be seen or heard from again. I guess the thing I'd resent most is, is I would resent that, you know, at least when you're home, if the phone rings, you have the option of not answering it. On the internet, people can send you messages all the time you don't even want to hear from. Number eight, Pacific Palisades. He risked his life to save me, which makes him a hero, but he's like still a dad, not a date. I don't think of Nick as a father. I mean, it's not like we're related by blood or anything. He married my mother, that's all. Besides, he's way too good for her. This primetime soap opera was set in Los Angeles, situated about 20 miles west of downtown LA. Palm trees and pricey purchases abound, and yet another venture from executive producer Aaron Spelling in the 90s. So grab your cocktail glasses, credit cards, and don't forget your fancy pants. Dramatizing the lives of young professionals who have it all, but haven't paid for it yet. It surrounds the lives and careers of several couples and neighbors in their upscale community. The hour-long melodrama was originally supposed to be a starring vehicle for Baywatch's Erica Eleniak, initially intended to play the role of Laura, but turned it down due to a racy scene where a character described as an aggressive real estate agent seduces a client to secure an offer. This scene was eventually toned down, but Eleniak still passed on the role. In a lazy attempt to entice new viewers into tuning in, the network dug up Joan Collins and slapped on a fresh coat of paint, brought on to play Laura's mother, first appearing in episode four, aptly titled All Hell Breaks Loose. Audiences saw right through this last minute attempt to boost ratings. Critics had already voiced their split opinions on Pacific Palisades at the time of the show's premiere. One side took the stance that Palisades on the whole had no redeeming qualities, and the other side claims Palisades have less in common with other spelling ventures like Melrose Place, and more in common with better rated shows like Knott's Landing and another drama from former Knott's Landing producers, Homefront, which managed to last a little longer than Palisades, but only with the help from fans. In April 11th, 1992 issue of TV Guide ran an SOS, Save Our Shows campaign, to save five series from cancellation. These five endangered titles included Homefront and two other period pieces that were set in the 1950s, Brooklyn Bridge on CBS and I'll Fly Away on NBC. Unfortunately for Pacific Palisades, no such effort was undertaken to see it remain on air. Canceled on its 13th episode, ironically titled Endgame, 
Pacific Palisades would only stretch from April to July, but would have no doubt picked up a few fans along the way. Number seven, over the top. The social graces have been totally bastardized by the MTV generation. He called you a bastard, dude. <laughs> oh, that's harsh, man. Extremely short-lived, Over the Top aired on ABC for just three or four episodes, depending on where you lived. The show, while universally panned by critics, remains a firm favorite amongst Curry fans. In a rare departure from his usual catalog of villains and strange characters, Curry plays Simon Ferguson, an out-of-work actor who moves into a Manhattan hotel with his ex-wife, Adley. Though the divorced couple were only married for 12 days, 20 years prior, he lands jobless on the steps of the elegantly run-down hotel Manhattan, where Potts resides with her teenage daughter and seven-year-old son. Overly emotional chef Yorgo is played by Carell, and his performance certainly lives up to the show's title. No one eats food out of a plastic bag unless they are a prisoner of war. <laughs> Chips, dip, and soda. Cleops, bloopers, and Simpson! Most of the starring cast is guilty of the same, but in the case of Curry, the act still manages to bring an uptick in production value. As the story goes, Curry requested that his good friend and real-life next-door neighbor, Annie Potts, join him on the project. Potts noted how Curry modeled the over-the-top character's relationship on their own longtime friendship. At the time, Potts was under contract to star in another production, Dangerous Minds. But when ABC dropped that movie-based TV drama, Potts excitedly took the opportunity to join the cast. By the time the pilot was filmed, the ABC Entertainment president had been replaced by another. A replacement who, coincidentally, the over-the-top executive producer was currently dating. Rumors began to circulate that the series was only picked up as a result of their romance, and not on its own merit. And the show entered the television schedule shrouded in gossip, and stuck with a reputation it never deserved. Between the series being picked up and the original premiere date of September 23rd, the relationship between the two came to an end. Subsequently, elements of the original pilot were scrapped and reshaped. Some actors were recast and the setting was changed from an upstate New York bed and breakfast to a midtown New York City hotel. The show finally premiered on October 21st opposite the World Series. As a result, it received the lowest ratings ABC had ever seen for a non-rerun on a Tuesday evening. The final nail in the coffin came when the fourth and final episode to be aired went on U.S. election night. And in some markets, the show was removed from schedules completely to focus on election coverage. Production was instantly halted two episodes shy of the standard 13-episode order for a new series, leaving the final two discarded altogether. Ultimately, people say the show still holds up well, and many fans feel it would have fared much better with a stronger promotion by ABC or perhaps an air date a few years down the line. Number 6, Tarzan, The Epic Adventure. will submit to my wishes. I bow to no one. Based on the legendary character Tarzan, originating in a series of 24 adventure novels written by Edgar Rice Burroughs, published between 1912 and 1966, to be followed by several novels either co-written by Burroughs or officially authorized through his estate. The tales are considered classic literature and are arguably the author's best known work. Having been adapted many times over, complete or in part for radio, television, stage, and cinema. In fact, it's been adapted for film more times than any other book. In this rendition, Tarzan returns to Africa to defend his jungle from both human and supernatural foes alike. With a little help from his friends, including in one episode, Carson Napier of Venus, who's also authored by creator Edgar Rice Burroughs, its first-run syndication kicked off August 28th as a two-hour movie split between the first two episodes. Actor Joe Lara, who portrays Tarzan, is no stranger to the role. Taking on the mantle of Lord of the Apes in Tarzan in Manhattan back in 1989, a CBS television movie wherein Tarzan leaves Africa for New York City 
in order to seek vengeance for the murder of his ape mother and to rescue a kidnapped baby chimpanzee. Her father, Archie, has his doubts about the ape man. Put on some pose, you pervert! The epic adventures, however, would focus on the character of Tarzan in his early years, after his first exposure to civilization, but before his marriage to Jane. Filmed at the Sun City Resort in South Africa, the show laid claim to being one of the few adaptations that was actually filmed on the continent. Additionally, making an honest effort to incorporate anything it could reference from its source material. Though only 22 episodes were ever produced, they crammed as much in as they possibly could. And while some will be certain to adamantly profess their absolute enjoyment and appreciation for the adventure series, it should be noted that audience ratings around the net show an extremely lopsided poll time and time again, with an overwhelming majority finding it unworthy of their time. Still, some people like the cheesiness and were left dreaming of a second season, complete with more crossover characters from the beloved novels and others introduced over Tarzan's lengthy history in the public eye. Tragically, the actor-musician Joe Lara was only 58 years old when he, with his wife and five others, died in the crash of a small jet near Nashville, Tennessee in 2021. Tarzan the Epic Adventures is currently free to stream on Tubi for those interested in checking it out. Are a lot of people just getting on to the internet because they feel that they have to get onto the playing field, so to speak? Well, it's very hip to be on the internet right now. Number five, Sarah, Pearl. Stephen Pinch on with the woman. Seems I owe you five dollars. You owe me a hell of a lot more than that. <laughs> Breath freshener? <laughs> Rhea Perlman stars as a plain-talking, widowed grandmother who decides to enroll in college. The Emmy-winning actress is best known for her role as head waitress Carla in the sitcom Cheers. Leaving for Europe and she's, she's not going to be back to Cheers ever. I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. Over the course of 11 seasons, she was nominated for 10 Emmy Awards for Outstanding Supporting Actress and was nominated for a record six Golden Globe Awards for Best Supporting Actress in a Television Series, seeing a boost in notoriety in the mid-90s by landing parts on the big screen in 1995's Canadian Bacon and 1996's Matilda. On September 16th, CBS premiered a new sitcom, Pearl. Pearlman served as a producer and star of the series. Her character, Pearl, works as a loading dock supervisor for Electronics University. Her desire to get a higher education leads her to enroll in locally prestigious Swindon University, where, to her surprise, she's accepted into the night school program. While juggling her already exhausting daily responsibilities, she's determined to reach this educational goal she set for herself. The series centered its conflict around the clash between Pearl and a professor of a required course that she's forced to suffer through in order to complete her studies. Studies that come with additional distractions, such as a class clown played by Kevin Corrigan, both a face you recognize and a name you've never heard, and a newfound rival, class overachiever Amy, played by Lucy Liu in her first starring role in a television series although appearing in tiny parts on a number of early 90s TV shows. For example, L.A. Law in 1993. Her work on this short-lived series no doubt aided in her being cast in 1997's legal comedy drama Ally McBeal. Longtime actor Malcolm McDowell plays the stuffy, elitist, egotistical humanities professor, complicating matters with his belief that higher education is for a cultured elite not working-class people like Pearl. He therefore sets out to embarrass and belittle her whenever possible, in hopes that she will withdraw from the university. What's more, McDowell's comedic timing plays exceedingly well, despite the overall condescending nature of his character and the biting lines he's given to deliver. No less than what you would expect from an actor of his caliber. People thoroughly enjoyed Pearl for all of its 22 episodes. So when the season finale came to a close on June 25th, there were sure to be viewers awaiting word of a second season premiere date. To their dismay, it just never happened. 
The network greedily pried open this clamshell, but there was simply no pearl to be found. Originally scheduled on Wednesday nights, opposite the John Larroquette show, Pearl was looking like a hit. But shortly thereafter, the ratings began to steadily decline. Gimmicks were added in an effort to get the show back on track, such as shoehorning in guest appearances from people off Pearlman's friends list, such as Mara Wilson, Ted Danson, or even husband Danny DeVito. It was all too little, too late, and the ratings continued to plummet, leaving a legacy of 22 decent episodes behind. This isn't too bad compared to many other single-season sitcoms, especially when you take into consideration just how basic and bland the storyline truly was to begin with. Number 4. Life's Work So cute. Is this your life? It's so pathetic. Stand-up comic Lisa Ann Walter was given a second shot at starring in a sitcom. Walter was an actress-turned-stand-up comedian whose voice of a busy working mom became a top headlining act during the 90s. Her previous shot was My Wildest Dreams, which lasted less than a month on Fox in the summer of 95. Her role as Lisa McGinnis, suburban New Jersey wife and mother of two, portrayed a record studio employee who fantasized about becoming a rock star. This time around, ABC would rehash practically the same concept. Walter plays Lisa Ann Hunter, a feisty optimist who can stand up to her mother and her superiors at work. She and her basketball coach husband raised their two kids and struggled to compromise on splitting parental duties. Only here, Lisa Ann's ambition is not that of becoming a rock star, but fulfilling her lifelong dream to practice law. So same idea, only slightly more stale. With a storyline like that, it's no wonder they had to resort to scripting in seemingly unrelated statements for shock value. Nestled between Roseanne and Home Improvement on ABC's Tuesday night block of comedies, life's work was expected to be a hit, and by all accounts, it was. It only had to retain that lead-in audience from Roseanne and keep them tuned in until Home Improvement, a job it was successful completing to begin with. Trouble arose as weeks passed and the final season of Roseanne suffered a drastic drop in viewership. Audiences were unsatisfied with the laughable plot of the Connors winning the lottery, and John Goodman was absent for most of the season. He was busy filming his parts for The Big Lebowski. As more and more people changed the channel on Roseanne, lower and lower ratings were revealed on Life's Work. Following the January 28th airing of the 15th episode, Neighbors, viewers would return to find it replaced with The Drew Carey Show. The slot would later be filled with reruns of Ellen, and eventually even Dan Aykroyd's own short-lived sitcom Soul Man would call that slot home. Rumors running at the time were that the then head of ABC didn't like the show, or its brash female lead. Naturally, rumors being what they are, none of this can be confirmed. But what is evident is ABC's lack of effort to get life's work back on track. In a turn of events, fans of the show took it upon themselves to put in the effort to get the series back on air. Internet petition and a letter writing campaign kicked off, which built a massive support for the series, particularly in Chicago and Massachusetts. Finally, in May of 1997, ABC was so annoyed at the attention the show was getting that they put it back on the air with three unaired episodes and summer reruns. Shortly thereafter, Life's Work was officially canceled despite the fact the ratings had actually improved. Really interesting. Hang on a second. I, 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 what? <laughs> Number three, Party Girl. Is teaching a class in English the language? <laughs> <laughs> you might want to get that taken care of. The attitude? <laughs> Produced in association with Warner Brothers Television, Party Girl would be based on the 1995 film of the same name. The comedy drama starred Parker Posey. At the time, she was labeled Queen of the Indies for her roles in a succession of independent films throughout the 90s. In Party Girl, she plays Mary, a free-spirited young woman living in New York City who fills her days by going to nightclubs and house parties. After being arrested for staging an illegal underground rave, she's bailed out by her godmother, putting her in a position where she's forced to take up work as a librarian in order to pay the rent. I assume you're familiar with the Dewey Decimal System? 
However, the watered-down Fox version viewers got was naturally toned down to be suitable for a 9 p.m. Monday night time slot. And to their credit, they actively took steps to portray the upcoming series in a more family-friendly light. For starters, they chose to cast Christine Taylor in an effort to utilize her recent success in the wildly popular parody The Brady Bunch Movie as older sister Marsha. The series would of course feature some adaptations, but stays close to the basic plot of the source material. She's our newest clerk. I assume you're familiar with the Dewey Decimal System? <laughs> In fact, the majority of the plot from the film, Watered Down, made it into the pilot episode. After watching the pilot, critics pointed out that rather than trust her acting instincts, Taylor opts to emulate Alicia Silverstone in Clueless, minus the charisma. And this lies the real problem. The role was cast poorly. You can't take Marsha Brady and turn her into Mary. It just doesn't work. For fans of the film, this was an immediate turnoff. It felt like Taylor was doing a spoof of Parker Posey playing Mary. Despite the network's attempts, some still found the material that made it onto the small screen to be borderline inappropriate for a Monday night sitcom. Much of the shock value humor comes across as being forced into the script. It's not necessarily out of place, it's just not done convincingly. What people point out as having enjoyed most about the show was the wise-cracking character Derek. Oh look, it's street walking, Barbie. <laughs> Here's something to get Ken back in the camper. <laughs> but even while being momentarily entertained, it only further serves to highlight how mundane the remainder of the episode is. Although six episodes were filmed, only four were aired, and the show was quickly canceled a month after debut. Number two, The Tony Danza Show. <laughs> Pretty excited about a chair, huh? <laughs> Try not to get it wet. <laughs> it's difficult to blame the networks for all these repeated attempts to see one of these countless Danza-focused sitcoms or talk shows really take off. One of these times the risk is undertaken could have suddenly paid off with an unexpected overnight success. The guy does come across as friendly, agreeable, and overflowing with a genuine witless charm. What's more, he's readily available at the drop of a cabbie's hat, seeing as how he doesn't stray all too often over to the big screen for starring roles. Truth be told, a large portion of the market does find appeal in the simplicity of the storylines and the endearing nature that most of these Danza vehicles possess. And accordingly, they will continue to opt to go for the low-hanging fruit, easy pickings with Danza on the roster. The network doesn't have to pay top dollar for a bigger name in showbiz. Further savings are pocketed when you take into account that they merely have to fashion another Tony from that same rotating wardrobe he's sported for decades. In this series, fans of the actor will feel right at home as we're introduced to Tony Danza as Tony DeMeo in The Tony Danza Show. As a sports writer who's handicapped by being ill-equipped to handle the complexities of using a computer. Most of the show's sitcom humor is fueled by his raising a rebellious 16-year-old daughter Daughter, Tina and 11 year old hypochondriac daughter Mickey and it's done surprisingly well. The writing is exactly what you'd expect but the cast holds it together. It presents a convincing family unit. As far as these identical Danza downers go, this one isn't half bad. The five installments that the public actually got a chance to see premiered beginning September, either by a miraculous intervention or as the result of an unfortunate mathematical mishap, it's hard to say, but some form of supernatural forces were at work when Danza brought home favorite male performer in a new TV series at the 24th People's Choice Awards for his performance in this very show. Come December 10th, a whopping nine episodes of the Tony DeMeo show were left unaired entirely. Daddy, you're the best. Yeah, 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 I know, I'm just the best. Have a seat. Number one, Profit. The office later today, I can pick him up then. Uh, no, you don't have to do that. I'll modem them to you right now. What's your modem number? Uh, 555-0120. Between April 8th and 29th, a Fox drama series from Canal Entertainment would quickly become a cult favorite. 
Although only lasting for eight episodes, it left an impression on audiences that keeps the series alive in spirit by discussing it to this very day. A frequent request in our comments section, it comes highly recommended by those who know. And if you don't know, a psychopathic corporate climber at a multi-billion dollar conglomerate uses theft, forgery, and murder to get what he wants. Lead character Jim Prophet is the new junior vice president for acquisitions, but he's already intent on leaving this position behind for even bigger and better things at any cost, using his evenings to scare up any dirt that he can get his greedy hands on. Dirt that is meant to soil the names and reputations of anyone who stands between him and his twisted perception of success. Debuting as a two-hour movie, it was received as being freshly original, but also a little sluggish. When pairing the remarks on pacing and the lack of any warmth to be found in the character's situations, the series was clearly not going to be for everyone. For starters, Jim's abusive father imprisoned him in a cardboard moving box. His only childhood contact with the outside world was via a hole in the box, through which young Jim watched TV. The cast of characters alone provides plenty of examples of just how icy the show was crafted to feel. Prophet's chief executive is a heartless degenerate. His own brother is a drunkard who neglects his wife. His company's vice president is having a scandalous affair with his security chief, and his secretary is embroiled in an embezzlement scheme, ranking 138 out of 160 shows that 1996 season. Profit was canceled after only five out of the nine hours produced were actually broadcast by Fox. Nielsen ratings the official cause cited, but many other factors have left the program in the red, one being the flood of phone calls and negative publicity surrounding the clear pushing of boundaries on TV at the time. Another portion of the public wasn't all too thrilled with the portrayal of life in the business community. Airings of Profit consistently lost almost all the lead-in audience from the smash hit Melrose Place, angering executive producer Aaron Spelling, especially after Time Magazine and Entertainment Weekly published rave reviews of Profit and scathing reviews of Spelling's recent work. Coincidentally, Spelling had approached Prophet's main star in 1992 to play the role of Jake Hansen on Melrose Place. Interestingly, in mid-2018, the series star stated that a reboot of Prophet was under development by director-producer Tanya McKiernan, daughter of Stephen J. Cannell. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to leave a comment below if you remember watching any of these, or just to share your opinion, we would love to hear it.